Welcome to The Lawyerist Podcast, a series of discussions with entrepreneurs and innovators about building a successful law practice in today's challenging and constantly changing legal market. Lawyerist supports attorneys building client-centered and future-oriented small law firms through community, content, and coaching, both online and through the Lawyerist Lab and Accelerator. And now, here are the co-authors of The Small Firm Roadmap and your podcast hosts. Hi, I'm Sam Glover. And I'm Laura Briggs, and this is episode 274 of the Lawyerist Podcast, part of the Legal Talk Network. Today, we're talking with Mike Michalowicz about his book, Fix This Next, about what to work on next in your law firm. Today's podcast is brought to you by Smith AI, Text Expander, LawPay, and Back Office Betties. We wouldn't be able to do our show without their support, so stay tuned. We'll tell you more about them later on. Laura, welcome back to the podcast, now as a co-host. It's nice to have you. Yes, I'm excited to be here. (laughs) (laughs) For those who may have missed Laura's episode before, she has joined Lawyerist, how long ago was it now? It's only been three months, so three months ago. (laughs) That's true. They have been the three longest months in world (laughs) history. But Yes, accurate. (laughs) (laughs) No, it's been awesome to have you. And now we're going to talk about some additional options available to our labsters. You are doing some coaching in the lab. Yes, I think this is one of the ways that we're trying to serve our labsters with whatever it is that they need the help with the most right now. And so I'm doing coaching with labsters on things like how to delegate to your virtual team, you know, writing job descriptions to hire contractors, Facebook ads, and overall marketing. And we've done a couple already, and I think it's really helpful for those people who have those marketing-specific questions. Yeah, it's been neat for me to see because, like, you joined our team to, to do marketing primarily, and you have dove in headfirst into that world and um, have come out with a ton of knowledge about how to do all those advertising options from Facebook ads to display ads to content-based marketing. And um, yeah, I think it's awesome that now we're able to share that that knowledge. So it's pretty cool. Yeah. I think a lot of attorneys right now are at least taking that step back to think about what does my marketing look mm-hmm. like now and how do I need to change it? And so it's a great way to give them that help they need in this current moment with figuring out where is my marketing go from here? Are my old strategies no longer working or do they need to be adapting? And I think it's true because we're doing so many things at Lawyerist with our own marketing right now that we can speak pretty authentically to what's working right now and some of the strategies that we've seen be effective. So it's been really cool to see people pivoting in their own law firm and also figuring out how they can hire virtual help to get these things done. For sure. Which is, I mean, that that actually comes more from what you were doing before you came to us, where you, you were doing a lot of content writing and working with a bunch of independent contractors and as an independent contractor. And so you're able to talk a lot about how to make those relationships productive. Yeah, I think, unfortunately, many people have been burned <laughs> with hiring <laughs> freelancers before. And so that's usually how those conversations kick off is, okay, well, how do I hire someone for marketing or a paralegal or my first virtual assistant and get the right person this time mm-hmm. around? And a lot of that really does fall down to you know, our podcast episode where we went over job descriptions. But a lot of it too is how do you interview these people? How do you give them a test job? And how do you figure out who's the right person to partner with you? And how do you be a good manager? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because it isn't, I think everyone has this dream of onboarding someone and then saying like, okay, perfect. You can now take over everything. And it just doesn't work like that. So when doing a lot of coaching around, how do you set this relationship up and how do you respond when there's problems early on to figure out, can these problems be fixed or do we need to hire somebody else altogether? Yeah. So if you're listening and you're in lab, um, Laura is now available to you for coaching sessions. And if you're not in lab and you want to know more about having people like Laura and Stephanie and Jennifer helping out with your practice, then go to lawyerist.com slash lab and and find out more. So thanks, Laura. Uh, You'll be hearing more from Laura in the near future, I think, by the way. Um, We're going to have her join us for hosting duties more often. So uh, now we've got a brief sponsored conversation with Maddie Martin from Smith AI and then my conversation with Mike Michalowicz. Hi, I'm Maddie Martin, the Head of Growth and Education for Smith AI Virtual Receptionists. Hi, Maddie. Welcome back to the podcast. I imagine it's a busy time for virtual receptionists right now as everybody's finally getting with the program and hiring you. Very much so. And we are very grateful to have a 100% remote team already. So we weren't scrambling and could get to work for everyone who needs us. That raises a good point. 
I'm sure things are still busy for you, um, but hopefully, unfortunately, having to adjust to the current circumstances is not one of the things that you're busy with. And as somebody who's at home with two kids and a spouse right now in my normally peaceful home office, I know everyone has a lot going on right now in our, um, quote, workspaces. (laughs) And so I'm wondering, how do we maintain our standards for responsiveness and professionalism in light of this and, you know, where are those expectations? How should they, where should we be setting them right now? Yeah, I think that setting expectations is always important. The Clio report from last year showed that clearly clients have expectations that lawyers are not always aware of around the information provided up front around, you know, the duration and cost and extent to which work is needed to complete a case or or work on a matter. But what we know is that there are some things that will be tolerated that may be humorous or discounted, like a, you know, kid uh, chirping in during a conference call, Mm -hmm. you know, that's fine. That's not a negative experience. It's human and it's normal, but not responding to phone calls or not responding to existing clients who have inquiries about where their case uh, stands, that's not acceptable. Um, And there are plenty of solutions in place that uh, you can deploy to make sure that your reputation isn't harmed and your reviews aren't harmed during this period when some things are tolerated and others are not. Yeah, that's a really good point because like, if you think that somebody's going to be more tolerant than they are and they're unhappy about it, they may be unhappy enough to leave a review. And it's not like Google is going to wipe all of its reviews once we everyone goes back to work. <laughs> right. And not that only happens. that, <laughs> but imagine like, you know, Google also doesn't wipe the review when you said the food was really good at a restaurant, but I didn't like the service. Mm-hmm. You know, that review is just as legitimate as another one. So imagine that in the context of a law firm, you know, it was really hard to get in touch with them. But once I did, you know, they did a great job with handling my case. Nobody's going to look at the date of the review and go, oh, wait, that was during the pandemic. Oh, absolutely. You're not you're not given that that grace. That's just going to live with you. Very rarely would you get that grace, so you can't assume and expect that grace. Mm-hmm. That's a good point. Uh, obviously, making sure that the phones get answered uh, is one of the really key things here, so that people feel like they have been responded to instead of leaving somebody hanging. Right. Well, not only that. I mean, you want to answer your phone so people know that you're accepting clients and you're still in business. And if you haven't communicated that broadly to your audience of clients and potential clients, I encourage you to do so proactively by email or whatever means you do so. Maybe that's even a text message or on your Facebook page. But when you have the inbound request come through, what we know is that you know about sixty percent of people who contact a firm contact more than one firm when shopping for an attorney Mm -hmm. and that the number one factor of you know whether or not they're going to hire the firm is based on the initial responsiveness to the first call or email so your competitive advantage right now and it is important to consider your competitive advantage right now is in your level of responsiveness and keeping in mind that you know it shouldn't be the case that oh i'll call back when i have a quiet non kid in Fused office, but when I can respond right now, and if you don't have that available, then you do two things. You very likely potentially lose the client, and you also potentially give the impression that you're not actually operating a, an active firm right now. Yeah. I would urge people to think about it this way, right? So your clients have written down, find a lawyer on their task list. And so what can you do that allows them to check that off? If they've left a voicemail, they haven't found a lawyer. They're probably going to keep calling. If they've talked with someone who represents your firm, then they have a call into a lawyer and they can probably, they might not be able to check it off yet, but that might be the point at which they're like, nope, this is, I'm good. I'm on my way. Um, and then obviously once they've talked to you and, and have a signed retainer or have written a check, then they can check that off and say, I have a lawyer. And so the further you can get towards them checking that off, the less likely it is that they're going to move on and go to somebody else. So stop that process where you can. Yes. And I would say that my argument would be if they have that list item that says, you know, find a lawyer, it actually is checked off as soon as they make contact Mm -hmm. and schedule that first appointment with you, you know, just given the likelihood that they are going with the first firm they, they get in touch with. Very cool. Yep. So uh, listeners, you can visit smith.ai, that's the web address, smith.ai, and you can use the code lawyerist100 to get $100 off each of phone and chat. And for that chat, Smith will waive the setup fee for listeners, which is awesome. Maddie, thanks so much for being on the podcast again, and thanks for that great discount. Thanks so much, Sam. Thanks for having me. Hey. 
Hey, Sam, this is Mike Michalowicz here, the author of Profit First, Clockwork, and now Fix This Next. And thanks for having me on your show. Well, welcome back. It was great to have you last time to talk about Profit First. And yeah, I think you did a workshop with our lab members as well, which they found really useful. So I love hearing that. Yeah, it's loved, I love just seeing Profit First out in the quote unquote real world mm-hmm. and, uh, and serving so many people and so many people implementing it. So I am curious, before we move to fix this next, which is what we're going to talk about, I don't know about you, but I was big into the getting things done thing. And the the nature of it is that everybody takes it and then hacks it. And I'm wondering if Profit First is similar, where do people just follow it by the book? Or do you do you hear back about a lot of people sort of hacking it to be their their own way? Yeah, people are hacking it. It's, um, you know, Profit First is a framework, and it never was intended to be the one and only kind of standards. But the essence of it, I, I think pretty much stays the same. It's hard to estimate it exactly, but we believe over 350,000 companies have implemented it. And, uh, you know, we have thousands of case studies that come in mm-hmm. and, uh, there's everything from the most rudimentary setup, which is simply to set up a profit account and allocate a small percentage to these very complex setups that people have multiple banks and they've modified the account names to satisfy their needs. But that's the idea is, is to lean into it in, in a way that serves your business most effectively. So it's just, it's kind of cool to see how it's morphing so much so that we actually have books. Like there's these derivative books. Right. <laughs> Profit first for e-commerce. We actually are working on a book, Profit first for lawyers. So yeah, yeah, it gets modified. Very cool. So how did you get from there to the current book, Fix This Next? Like what can readers expect from Fix This Next, which will have been available for purchase for like two days as of the time people are hearing this podcast. So I, um, <laughs> when I write a book, I, uh, it takes me about five years to write a book. It's it's definitely a labor of love, um, but it's a labor for me. And mm-hmm. I conduct a lot of research and so forth. But how I start things off is I simply ask my readership, you know, what do you need now? Mm-hmm. And so I uh, I emailed my readership about five years ago and uh, asking, you know, what's the biggest challenge you're facing? Because that's the best way to find someone's needs is what's your challenge? And I got feedback that day. Some of the feedback was from the same people responding accidentally, I believe, multiple times. And their challenge changed, which meant the same people had a different challenge, at least a different perception of what their challenge was on the same day. Yeah. And I was like, oh, that's a problem. And so it became clear that the thesis for this book was that the biggest challenge business owners have is knowing what their biggest challenge is. That sounds right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I had to find, how do you find out what is the one thing you should be working on? And that's what I devoted the research research toward, and and that's what I wrote the book about. So let's clarify, because I just raised getting things done, which I didn't do on purpose here. Fix This Next is not a productivity guide, though. No. Because it's easy to see that what's my biggest challenge, what to work on next. Yeah. This isn't about productivity. This is about prioritizing your challenges, right? That's exactly it. There's a common uh, DNA for all types of businesses. And um, regardless if you're an attorney or an accountant or a manufacturer or a pizza shop owner, I found there's this, not everything's the same, but there's a common you know, baseline DNA. And what we need to do is analyze it and uh, and see what's not being satisfied. And, and it works in this, this sequence. Most entrepreneurs, though, just revert to the apparent issues. There, there's a constant stream of stuff that we can do. So uh, we often call it putting out fires. Like, oh, here's all these issues for the day. Right. I'm going to put these fires out. And at the end of the day, whatever the agenda or vision we had for the business is pushed off yet another day and another day. And so how do we break out of that kind of firefighter mode and and start targeting the one significant impactful issue as opposed to a parent issue for the business? Right. I mean, as we're recording this podcast, we're, I assume you're, you probably haven't left your house much, if at all. Um, and, right. and I certainly haven't for about a month now. Yeah. And I'm guessing that's true for most of our listeners too. And that feels like a really good example of the problem with putting out fires all the time. <laughs> because for 13 years, I've been telling lawyers to go paperless, to invest in remote working uh, structures for their for their companies. For 13 years, I've been telling lawyers to do these things that will be good for their businesses anyway. Yeah. Had they done them, um, it would have meant that the current disruption to their business would have been little more than a, a small speed bump. And I feel like if you don't take the time to stop putting out fires and work on your business to work on those other things, that is the kind of thing that might eventually happen to you. And it might never, you might get lucky, but eventually you're going to get hit by a truck. And and that's what the current situation kind of feels like for people that didn't stop to do that work. You know, there's an interesting 
uh, kind of illustration around this. I, I read about it in the book. And what I identified is it's something that we just know about humanity, that we are very focused on the uh, immediate pain and not the long-term solution. Mm -hmm. So we have this uh, urgency to just do the quick fix. And uh, the illustration is this. You can, on a legal pad, if you're a lawyer, on a legal pad, draw the letter A on the center of a piece of paper, but you can do this in your mind too. And you draw that letter A and you put a circle around it. And what it, that A represents is where we are now. And for many businesses, it's challenges or crisis for some businesses. Mm -hmm. Then what you do, step two, is you draw an arrow away from A. So starting at A and going out in any direction you choose. And what that line represents is an action you can take in this immediate moment to get out of the crisis or challenge in A. That's the relief, mm -hmm. what, what we normally do. But now you can draw another arrow in another direction, and maybe the opposite direction, away from A. And what that represents is an alternative path. And you can repeat this process over and over again. So you have all these different arrows pointing away from A. So you can do it five or six times. But now, as the final step, draw the letter B in the top left, for example, of that piece of paper and put a circle around it. And what B represents is what your business needs from you now. What's the one vital need that must be satisfied? And chances are very few or perhaps even none of the arrows were pointing to B. And this is illustrative of how we behave. We know we're in crisis and we just escape to a new spot, which ends up being simply a new A, <laughs> a new crisis. <laughs> and we do this again and again, and we start moving this kind of circuitous pattern. Right. So the real thing is, first, we need to know what do we need to do. And with that clarity of what we need to do, then when we make decisions in crisis, we can at least now align it in moving in that general direction. And that's the way to move our business forward permanently. But most of us never know what B is. So right. we just constantly are in this crisis, just escape crisis, escape crisis, and escape it yet again. So in Fix This Next, you introduce the concept of the, maybe it's something you've been talking about, but it, the business hierarchy of needs, which is a way of uh, a high level look at here, are all of the things your business needs, and are you addressing them in the right order and in the right amount? So maybe you could introduce that for us and talk about um, what is the business hierarchy of needs and where does it come from? Yeah. So the business hierarchy of needs was designed to pinpoint B, to give us that clarity of where we need to go. And it's derived from Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Very similar, but there's one very significant, important differentiator. As a primer, Maslow's hierarchy of needs was the study of human needs. What Maslow argued is that at the base of all human needs is physiological needs. We need to breathe air and uh, drink water and eat food to survive. And above that, as an example, the next level needs are safety needs in Maslow's hierarchy, the protection from harm, the elements, and it continues up to what he calls self-actualization, living life's purpose. Mm -hmm. If any time a base level need is not adequately satisfied, we revert to the satisfaction of it neurologically because we're, we're wired into ourselves. So I live in New Jersey and uh, this winter was pretty mild, but some winters can be you know, sub-zero Fahrenheit. And if I'm outside in a t-shirt and these temperatures come tearing <laughs> through, I will yeah. seek safety, uh, shelter, you know, or clothing. But what's interesting is there's always, there, there's a base below it, which is the physiological needs. If someone came running up behind me and put a plastic bag over my head and wrapped duct tape around it, which I argue being in New Jersey, that could happen. <laughs> and, uh, I will revert to an even more base level need, which is the need for oxygen. So I'll tear that bag away. Uh, before I then seek shelter. Or do yoga. <laughs> right, right, <exactly. laughs> right. Like that's way up on the self-actualization part of the of the hierarchy. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. That's funny. But this translates to the business hierarchy. But the, the substantial difference before I explain the business hierarchy is that we are neurologically wired into ourselves, of course. We are not neurologically wired into our business. And that's the problem. Many business owners think that we can trust our gut, that we instinctually know what to do. And that's, from my research, is simply not the fact. Right. When it comes to us, we will naturally proceed up the hierarchy just because that's that's how humans do things. Right. We're yeah, wired for it. Makes like, sense. Sam, say you and I, you know, we're, we're chit-chatting it up or we're, we're walking through town or something. And we start walking down a dark alley and we both get like a little, little shiver on down our neck. We're like, this doesn't feel right. Mm -hmm. We should turn around instantly. That's our, our senses triggering our instinct. So our sight, our hearing or triggering something's not right. And we should act upon that. If we continue on, we probably will be harmed. Don't do yoga in alleys. Got it. There's always the dark, dark alley, <laughs> New Jersey, 
bag <laughs> over your head. It's like, you know what I'm talking about. Yep. This is definitely where I live. So um, in the business hierarchy of needs, we're not wired into our business. So we don't have these triggers. So we trust our gut, but it doesn't necessarily serve us. Well, let me explain what the hierarchy is, and then then we can get into how to navigate around it. Perfect. The base level need for all business is sales. Sales is the creation of cash, and uh, it equates to Maslow's breathing effectively. It's oxygen. I mean, lawyers who are uncomfortable with the word sales can translate that to fees, if you like. Fee- yeah, <laughs> good, yeah, good point. Yeah, but it's exactly what it is. And if you have no fees, you don't have a sustainable business. Your business is suffocating. It is absolutely critical. Mm-hmm. Once that is satisfied adequately, we then move to the next level. The next level up is profit in the business hierarchy of needs. And profit is the creation of stability. No profit and your business is immediately at risk, regardless of the volume of sales. Mm -hmm. In fact, and this is an extreme story, but it's true and it's sad, but a very close friend of mine um, had a $250 million business. He was heralded for his financial success, but sadly, in retrospect, did not have financial acuity because he didn't address the profitability. And that business went out of business practically overnight, just made one bad decision, Mm -hmm. the vector cash flow, and they couldn't sustain. So you can have massive amounts of sales like he did, but with no profit. That's a key distinction that anyone who's read Profit First or listened to our last podcast will get, that sales and profit are different things. You can't necessarily build profit just by selling more stuff. That's right. That's why there's a distinction between the two. And sadly, Sam, some people think they can sell their way out of anything. That's, right. You know, sales yep. cures everything, which is total nonsense. You know, the right sales generate adequate profit. If you consider a structure like a building, if I put a first floor uh, building's profit on um, no sales, meaning there's no, no foundation, uh, it'll collapse on the, under the ground. Conversely, if I put this massive basement, huge volume of sales, but put a little tool shed above it of profit, it will fall within the sales and will collapse. Mm -hmm. So these always work in relation. The third level above profit is order. Order is the creation of organizational efficiency. It's where you don't have dependency on the business founder. It's not an owner operator anymore. It's a business owner and the operation components. Could you walk away from your own business and it would continue to do its thing. Yeah. That's the acid test. Mm-hmm. And can you leave your business? I actually, uh, tra- I used to travel a lot when COVID wasn't going on. I'm, it'll probably return. And admittedly, I'd stop by McDonald's every so often. <laughs> and so I started running a little test. I would go to the cashier and say, Hey, is the business owner here? I'd like to talk with them. And I cannot think of one instance of doing this like at least 30 or 40 times where the business owner was ever there. Right. I remember going to one place. This was the funniest. The cashier says, uh, she goes, uh, I have the business owner. She said, I don't think I ever met him. Oh, yeah, yeah. He came in two months ago to pick up the money. That was our line. <laughs> that, that is what the business owner of a, of a chain restaurant does is they, they show up to pick up the money. Yeah. And, and that's the definition of a business that has efficiency and order. Right. You know, the business owner is not, not doing stuff for the business. They're doing some much higher level stuff. I suspect they're scouting out new locations. The system that operates itself. And that's what, what happens at the order level is where the owner is not needed to operate the business. The level above order is called impact. Impact is the creation of transformation. This is where the business is out to shift people's lives. It's beyond the transaction. We are of greater service to people in a way that their lives are improved permanently or in a new way. And then the highest level is legacy. Legacy is the creation of permanence for a business. And it was, Sam, it was actually my favorite uh, discovery because I didn't realize this. The business owners that achieve legacy realize they were actually never business owners in the first place. Hmm. They've always been business stewards, that they've brought something to life. They've been a cog in the wheel in, in bringing something about, but that the business itself is greater and more important than their involvement in it. And the business is designed to have impact beyond them and into perpetuity. So that's that's the five levels of the business hierarchy of needs. I've been thinking about the legacy one lately just because I'm I'm thinking about my kids and like, you know, is there a way that I could build a business that would be something that then my kids could take on as something that they do later? And I know that's not exactly what you mean by legacy, but um, but that's just one of the th- ways that you can think about it that has been, uh, that I've been wondering, like, could I leave them a, a livelihood instead of just an inheritance? So. Yeah, exactly. So that is part of legacy. I mean, legacy is the continuance of the business because that is the most important element. Mm -hmm. And so it's 
the ultimate legacy is even beyond individual ownership or individual participation. It's about the business itself. But you do see it manifest in that the family, the next generation buys into the same values, that they live the same principles. And so they become a natural component of that legacy. So that's great. But you said uh, that most people who pick up your book are starting on probably one of the bottom two steps. And so we're going to take a quick break to hear from our sponsors. And when we come back, I want to hear from you some ideas about how we identify where we are and how we get even onto that third step of order in order to start building. So we'll be right back. Part of building a successful practice is finding the right payment partner. It's important to work with a processor that understands the complex rules for legal payments. LawPay is the only payment solution that ensures trust account compliance for both credit card and e-check transactions. Trust the only payment solution offered through the ABA Advantage program and all 50 state bars, LawPay. To learn more or to get started, visit lawpay.com lawyerist today. Support for today's episode comes from Back Office Betty's, the only virtual receptionist service exclusively dedicated to small law firms that offers a plan with unlimited calls. Their highly specialized service boasts customized call handling, relentlessly friendly team members, and unmatched quality. The Bettys are ready to help you grow your firm, even when you're out of the office. Visit www.backofficebettys.com slash lawyerist to try them out for one week free. Use promo code PODCAST to receive $150 off your first month. Boost your productivity and save time typing with Text Expander. You can make your own snippets or share and manage snippets for your organization, even if your team works from home. You'll reduce errors and increase productivity. Text Expander can save you so much time, it's like getting an extra employee. Text Expander is available for Mac, Windows, iPhone, iPad, and Chrome. Show listeners get 20% off their first year. Visit textexpander.com slash podcast to learn more about Text Expander. Okay, we're back. So, uh, Mike, I was watching you talk about the business hierarchy of needs, and you uh, were explaining that most people watching you or reading the book are probably starting on either trying to make sure they have enough sales or making sure they have enough profit. Yeah. So that really strongly resonates with me. Um, the idea of working on legacy feels so far away from most of the small firms that I come into contact with. Some are there but most really feel like they're just trying to figure out sales and profit. Some do try to skip that though. It's fun to start talking about <laughs> legacy. I skip right to order, you know, like that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's my favorite part. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's fun to skip, but ultimately it damages a business. So not for profits are notorious for this, Sam, is that a mm -hmm. not for profit will say, you know, we're going to change the world. That's an impact statement. We're going to change the world. We're going to make it forever a better place. That's an impact and legacy statement. And they set out to do this with a great mission, a great vision, but they don't think about sales, which in their case, they don't use the word sales or fees. Mm -hmm. They use the term contributions, donations, and they don't focus on that. And therefore there's no sustainability and so obvious, but when you're in it, it's not. And those businesses fall upon themselves. They've basically set a fourth story kind of layer or level uh, on thin air and it falls right to the ground and smashes. Speaking of which, it feels like the second best title for a book that you could write is Profit First for Nonprofits. <laughs> yeah, that's a good idea. That's a good idea. Yeah. We have to change the title to Purpose First because, you know, it's, it's funny. I spoke at a not for profit event. Uh, it was a big event and they said you can't use the word profit. It's a bad word. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that's, that's a horrible mentality to have. That's funny. Because we need sustainability. But most for-profit businesses could be relabeled as not-for-profits. Mm -hmm. We act that way. We skip levels. And I found if we follow the Pareto principle, it's about 80% of businesses are in a sales or a profit need. And perhaps more are in a profit need than sales. And so how it works is to go up this hierarchy, a very simple version of it is to simply ask yourself, do you have any sales? That's the first question. Mm -hmm. And if the answer is no sales, well, you got a sales problem. We, we, we're suffocating. <laughs> we need that oxygen of sales. Right. But then the second question is if you have some sales, say, is it adequate to support a degree of profitability? And for most businesses, the answer actually is yes. We have some sales coming in and it could support profitability. And if so, then we have to look at the profit level. And then we ask ourselves the same series of questions do we have any profit? And the answer is no, then you actually have a profit issue. My hunch is that uh, if all you do is put out fires and you don't have any time to think about order, you probably have enough sales. And you may think, well, I just need to find some more hours in the day. That's probably not what you need to be thinking about. You probably need to be moving on to figuring out how to pull the profit out of the sales you're already making, all the work you're already doing. That's exactly right. Some people believe the mythology that sales cures everything, and uh, that's not true. Mm -hmm. So sadly, some businesses 
go back to building this foundation of sales. That's the old, you know, massive foundation of sales. You, you've put a little tool shed above it of profit and the profit collapses within it. Actually, I'd argue the danger of sales that doesn't have the balance of profit is that sales adds stress. Mm -hmm. And every time you sell, you have a heightened obligation, right? You have to deliver on what you've sold. So whatever service you're providing, you got to now deliver on it. Well, the more you sell, the more obligation you have. The more obligation you have as a small business owner, usually the more work it's putting on your shoulders because we haven't nailed the order level yet. So now every time I sell more, I have to do more. I'm stressed out. Mm -hmm. To start relieving that stress, the first stage is profitability because profitability gives us runway. Uh, it gives us a uh, financial strength that if there's bumps or bruises or things need to be sped up or slowed down, we have the control of time because we have money. Money will buy us time in our business and then we can move on to order. So sales does not cure everything. Sales is necessary and it has to be in relation to healthy profit. So we'd focus on the profit model. And once you get the profit model down, you know that's like controlling costs. It's increasing margin. It's um, catering to uh, your best clients, buying your best products. As you do that, you may then actually cycle back down to sales because now you're in a position to sell more mm -hmm. under uh, strong profits, and then you amplify sales again. A visual for this is kind of like a volcano, how it builds a mountain, is you have that little structure of a mountain first, but then the volcano uh, pours out the lava, and it builds a bigger base to it, and it starts building up again, and then the lava spills out again, and the base gets even bigger in relation to the entire mountain. So the business hierarchy of needs is not a ladder. You don't climb to the top. You keep cycling around between elements of it, whatever needs to be satisfied next. So you've got your sales, you've got your profit nailed. And now it's time to start thinking about like, how do you build the machine of this business? I, I like to talk about it as the machine. Maybe that's not your favorite metaphor, but like, you know, thinking about it as like, how do we, you know, feed clients in the front end and send them out as happy clients that have gotten a plus amazing legal work, and it doesn't necessarily involve me, the business owner. So we, it's funny. Yeah, I like the machine. I, you know, I call it mastery reputation in the book. And uh, there's other elements. So, so at every level, there's five core needs. I found that's common for all businesses. But in the order level, there's this thing called mastery reputation. And my realization was when an organization has a reputation for being the best at something uh, among the client base, it usually means they've achieved a high degree of efficiency. Mm. If you think of like a heart surgeon, if you have a heart attack and, and you go to a heart surgeon, you want to know that heart surgeon has done it over and over again. They're going to have a mastery reputation because they've done that heart operation thousands of times before. So mastery reputation comes about through repetition and having a common outcome. In their case, you know, saving people's lives. Right. So the question when we come to order is, does your firm have a master reputation? Are you known to be the world's best at this? And if so, you have a repeatable process you're doing. Now, it doesn't mean you've taken off your shoulders. It simply means you have a repeatable process. You may be the doctor doing the heart surgery. The next stage with an order then is to disseminate or assign out that work from you while maintaining that master reputation. But it does start with a master reputation because now you've perfected a process. We try to get other people doing it. You categorize those bottom three parts of the hierarchy as get versus give. Can you explain that a little bit? Yeah. So uh, I pick on my mom here a little bit, but my mom <laughs> said to me, she goes, Mike, you have to give to get. You have to give to get. Mm. And uh, I hate to do this, Sam, but I'm calling bullshit on mom. Like, <laughs> <laughs> mom, sorry, you can't give to get. You have to get to give. And, and here's what I mean by this is that we need to get sales, the creation of cash. We need to get profit, the creation of stability. And we need to get order, the creation of efficiency. We have to get those things in order to have impact and to have legacy. You know, we, we talked about earlier, some businesses try to skip those levels. They try right to go to giving. And those businesses burn out so quickly. They give till it hurts. And it literally hurts the business and it goes out of business. So I tell business owners they have a responsibility to sell and be profitable and have efficiency. And our, our clients want that. Mm -hmm. Your clients will never come to you and say, hey, can you charge me more? Can you double the rates? Yeah, I mean, if they do, that's amazing. That's but... amazing. That is actually amazing. <laughs> They'll never say it though. But what they will say is, I want your undivided attention. I want to know that you're delivering the highest degree of services that you're capable of delivering to me. I don't want you to be distracted by needing that next customer. And all those things point to, you effectively have sales coming in, you effectively have profit and you've ordered because if you have profit and order coming in, 
you aren't worried. You have that runway. Mm -hmm. So we have to get in order to give. We've been having some interesting internal discussions around how do we think and talk about our business because lawyers is in the impact business, even though um, we're also working on the lower parts of the hierarchy. But sometimes it feels kind of gross to just be always talking about profit and sales. And how do you bring impact into the conversation, maybe even before you're ready to make that the challenge you're focusing on? Oh, great, great, great question. So those elements, every element's actually playing out at all times. Um, it's just where you concentrate your energy. Mm -hmm. So even if you're working on sales, you need to have a sales system, something that's repeatable. Well, that's part of order is systemization. Well, legacy and impact is derived or delivered through vision. So it's the communication of the vision. And it will naturally happen, particularly when you're talking about it. It's just when you get to that level, it becomes the all out concentration. So like in my own business, I talk about my vision regularly, which is to eradicate entrepreneurial poverty. This gap between what people think you're experiencing and what the reality is of your entrepreneurial endeavors and closing that gap. Because I think entrepreneurs need to be successful. Our, our world economy depends on it, particularly now. So I talk about the vision constantly, but it doesn't mean that I'm focused on being transformative all the time. Even my own business with COVID, uh, we sent out a survey, and this is one smart thing to do for any lawyer is as things change, ask your historical and uh, existing customer base, how can I serve you now in the, in the light of the new circumstances? I was, you know, I'm writing business books and that's what I do. And um, so I read me my list and said, what do you need now? What's the next business book? And what was interesting was they don't necessarily need a business book. The newest feedback is we simply need confidence that a lot of people are shaken right now. And so I'm going back to the most basic, basic level. I need to get back to creating the offering. That's if, if this, this is the triangle, the business hierarchy of needs is the kind of this triangle structure. The circle around the triangle is the offering itself. I need to go back to the base offering. What do I need to offer my readership now that's going to satisfy them around confidence? So I'm going back to that. We've developed a little basic prototype of a product that we're now offering to see if it's a service to them. And that may become a future book. Hmm. So that's one way is, is legacy and impact is something you're always going to be working on and delivering on, but it doesn't mean it's your core focus. The idea of fix this next is to identify the most important thing in the moment. You stay in the ballpark with everything else, but you're trying to hit home runs on this one thing right now. Do you have like a timeline like uh, for re-examining where you are in the hierarchy, what you should be focused on? Is it monthly, weekly, annually, or just whenever you need it? It's whenever you need it, but there's a trigger that identifies that. So once you identify what your need is, you do it right now, uh, and you, you figure out what the need is, you start satisfying it. There's two triggers. Once it's fully satisfied, reevaluate and see what you need next. That's one option. The other thing is when you have a high degree of confidence, it's on the trajectory to resolution, move on to the next thing. So here's an example. So one of the needs in the um, sales level is what's called lifestyle congruence. Basically, what do you need to live comfortably? And is this business designed from the sales side to support that? Uh, surprisingly, many, very few business owners know what they need personally and how it correlates to the business. Mm -hmm. So the business becomes arbitrary goals. Yeah, we need to do a million dollars. We need to do five million, whatever the number is. It's arbitrary. Well, figuring this out and calculating, it could be a good 20 minute exercise is pretty quick, right? That needs satisfied. So 20 minutes later, you're into finding the next need. Other ones like um, maybe uh, prospecting and getting the right avatars in. Well, that may be something that takes time to not just define, but really to see, are we getting traction on that? And so I talk about in the book, uh, this process is called OMEN. It's a method to do what you're doing and um, in a way to measure its progress. But prospects, it may be five or six weeks in, you're like, okay, we're starting to get a stream of prospects. I feel confident that this is going to continue. And then once you have that confidence, that's another trigger to go and evaluate what the next need is. Gotcha. Uh, give me your pitch for why somebody should go pick up your book um, now that it's on shelves. So if you don't know what your biggest challenge is, if you, you're questioning, what do I need to do now? That's definitely get the book. The other thing is, is you can just look in your historical progress. Is your business moving forward consistently and growing the way you envisioned? If so, you're on your course. Actually, I'd say in that case, don't read the book because you figured out your formula. It's working. But if you're frustrated, if you seem to repeat things over and over, or you're hitting your own version of a ceiling, then Fix This Next is, I think, the ideal tool because it'll pinpoint what to work on. Sadly, you talked about doing the right thing. And uh, some businesses 
do the wrong thing for the right need. Yeah. And you need to cycle through it. And this book will help other businesses, and this is more insidious, do the right thing, but for the wrong need. And that's a real problem because then you think, well, clearly this doesn't work. Well, yes, it was the right thing, just done at the wrong time. So fix this next. Also, make sure that you're doing the right thing at the right time. And then what if somebody's been listening to us uh, or whatever and has identified, yep, I'm definitely down in profit and sales. Should they get this book or should they start with profit first? Oh, well, profit first may be a solution for you. And there's other great books on financial acuity and books on sales. So you may have a sales need. Maybe you should get a sales book. I would still challenge people to start with Fix This Next because we only talked about the levels. Inside, there's what's called 25 core needs, hidden it's the DNA buried within the business hierarchy of needs. So it isn't just, I need sales. It's how you need it. There's a deliverable component to sales that many people don't consider that I talk about and fix this next. There's a collections component. So it's what kind of component. And so you really want to refine that in. So I, I think the book will be of value to you beyond knowing just the level you're at. Very cool. And if people want to know where to find it, uh, obviously click over to the show notes. We'll have links to Mike's book, Fix This Next, and his website where you can find information about uh, more resources and his previous books. Mike, thanks so much for being back on the podcast with us. We really appreciate it. Sam, it was, as always, it's a joy, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Stay safe. You too, brother. The Lawyers Podcast is produced by Laura Briggs and edited by Christopher Ng. Are you ready to implement the ideas we discuss here into your practice? Wondering what to do next? Well, here are your first two steps. If you haven't read the Small Firm Roadmap yet, grab the first chapter for free right now at lawyers.com book. Next, if you're looking for help beyond the book, then let's chat about whether our coaching communities are right for you. Head to lawyers.com community to schedule a 15-minute call with our community manager. The views expressed by the participants are their own and are not endorsed by Legal Talk Network. Nothing said in this podcast is legal advice for you.